coming up, an interview with one of the greatest rock singers in history. It's on a song that he co-wrote that spent a record 10 weeks at number two. Now, the song never got to number one. It had to settle for being the greatest bridesmaid in recorded history. Now, this 80s masterpiece was famous for its distinct ambient intro. Uh, it came from a future star who was discovered busking on the street. And the incomparable vocal, that came from a session where a mysterious, beautiful woman walked in and sat down right in front of the singer inspiring him to dial it up to 11, nailing the take. And then he rushed out to find the woman, but he never saw her again. Find out the mystery coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you have hour-long debates with your friends on who the greatest frontman is, greatest guitarist, or a hundred other things, you're gonna dig this channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now and click the bell so that you always know when our new interviews drop. Story straight from the legends. Uh, also, check out our exclusive content on Patreon. You're gonna dig it there. We have uh, a lot of great interviews, full interviews you won't find here. Also check out our merch, uh, including our Vintage Years collection. So I'm excited to bring you yet another episode from our series, Revelations, where featured artists go very deep on their greatest songs and albums Man, I'm excited to share an interview that I just did with one of the greatest rock singers in history. He just doesn't get the credit he deserves. Talking about Mr. Lou Graham, the voice of Foreigner. Sure. This is a band that is still not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but they absolutely should be. They've had more hits than the majority of the bands in there. It's ridiculous. Today, Lou Graham tells the story of Foreigner's classic 1981 hit, Waiting for a Girl Like You. It's a song that was written by he and uh, Mick Jones, went to number two and sat there for 10 weeks, mostly behind Olivia Newton-John's physical, which actually ended up being the biggest chart hit of the decade. Lou Graham tells us some really cool stories about this one, including a mysterious woman who came in and sat down uh, while he was in the middle of trying to nail down the vocal for this song, her beauty, her presence inspired him to go balls of the wall, and he just nailed a perfect take. And then he rushed out to try and track this girl down, find out who she was, and the famous keyboard player who created the ethereal intro it was discovered by producer Mutt Lang busking on the street. We actually have an interview with him in this as well. It's all coming up next in our exclusive Zoom session. As we go into this interview, I do want to thank our amazing sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses I wear every single day. Right now, Zenny has a feature that you can add to any frame called Transitions. Uh, the lenses automatically adapt to changing light. Transition lenses, they darken outdoors and then return to clear indoors very quickly. They are light, intelligent lenses. You gotta check it out today at our link below or download the new Zenny app. Right from the get-go, the, the song was very appe appealing, and, and uh, Mick had uh, 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 um, a, a lot of ideas for, for the, the instrumental backdrop and all the ethereal sounds and, and such, and, and uh, he, he had a, a rough idea of, of, of what he uh, uh, thought he heard the, the melody as being, and, and I stuck pretty close to that, but, but, but uh, you know, uh, as always, uh, uh, I was able to take uh, liberties whenever, whenever I, I felt I, I should, you know, and and uh, and um, it, it 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 turned out very emotional, and, and um, I, I thought it, I thought it was was uh, I mean, as I look back, I think it was one of the, at least the top top five uh, uh, foreigner songs ever well that ethereal beginning is unmistakable when you hear it come on the radio you know exactly what it is that well, that's came, thomas dolby yeah that came from thomas dolby right yes it did tell me about that because i know that mutt lang actually discovered him busking on the street and then and then worked with him over the years and and uh they, they became friendly but but when uh, when uh, when it was asked to 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 um, to to 
work on, on Foreigner Four. He 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 was he was hesitant apparently at first. He was not not a Foreigner fan because because I, I think he he um, you know he he was in he was in uh, the the next group of, of song stylists and, and looked. Uh, apparently at Foreigner with 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 uh, some disdain. Uh, uh, but but I think when he heard the song, he he, he was was intrigued enough to, to come and play on it, and, and uh, his contributions were 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 very important in in uh, I think in in uh, completing that song to the point where where it did as well as it did. And then of course uh, uh, he he contributed uh, to more songs on that album, in, including "Urgent" and "Jukebox Hero." You were probably watching the charts a little bit, probably. That oh, point. every week, yeah, <laughs> every week. <laughs> but such a major it departure was, uh, for the band. After so many straight ahead yeah. rockers, I mean, you came up with this very deep and atmospheric love song. What inspired yeah. the lyrics? Because that came from a really a deep place. Well, I, you know, I, I can't really put my finger on it. I thought um, my wife at the time was was uh, pregnant, and um, I felt, you know, this just it sort of just came to me from from nowhere in a way um and it had it had a real hold on me um emotionally like i actually couldn't be in the room when we were recording it if we if we were playing it back i had to leave the room i just kept you know breaking down and crying you know it was that that strong i thought i was going to have a, a baby girl but it it turned out to be a, a son god bless him and um you know, so it was an example of, you know, picking things out of the air when they're floating by, if you're in that mood and in that frame of mind. And uh, th this one I got hold of and uh, very, you know, came from somewhere very special. And as yeah. I say, it still, still has an emotional effect on me. I was a real neophyte. I'd never been near a professional studio at that point. Um, I was in I was in Europe, and uh, I, I'd made tapes and sent them around to record companies. And uh, I was doing very badly, and I actually sort of had to flee London because I was being hounded by uh, my landlord. And I went to Paris, and I was working in the metro as a as a busker um, with a guitar, actually, you know, playing Dylan songs and things for for Japanese tourists. I got a message from a friend in London saying this guy Mick Jones has been trying to go hold of you. And uh, you know, bear in mind that in those days, if you were from London, somebody says Mick Jones, and the first thing you think is the Clash, right? Uh, not foreigner who, who although they were mainly British, that you know they weren't as successful at that time in the UK as they were in the US. So you know, I called him back, and it was it was the other Mick Jones, it was the the foreigner Mick Jones, and um. He was in New York, and uh, they were most of the way through, you know, recording the the instrumentals for what turned out to be Four and a Four, and um, they weren't happy with the keyboards. You know, it was really the first time because I mean, Mick plays keyboards, but it was the first time he'd sort of he had keyboard based songs, ballads, you know, like Waiting for a Girl Like You on on an album, and he was just sort of limited as a keyboard player and didn't know much about synths. So that they'd heard my music because among the people that I sent my cassettes to was a company called Zomba, which of which Matt Langer was a, a co-founder. They're a publishing company and recording company in the in London. And so Matt had heard my cassette because they had been thinking about signing me as a writer, and he really liked the keyboard playing because he's got a great ear, you know, great good at spotting talent. So they, they called me and said, "Look, you know." when would you be able to come and do a couple of days session work in New York? Mm -hmm. 
I'm sitting on my backside in a subway station in Paris, looking at a guitar box with a few francs in it. You know, um, it's like twist my arm, I'll, I'll catch the next plane. Anyway, so you know, they they let me have at it, and they were actually under the gun because uh, they were trying to do vocals um, during the day, and then at night I would do the keyboards. So they would very often leave me alone with a relief engineer overnight. And in the morning, the band and, and Mutt would come in and they'd listen to what I'd done. And they gave me like a laminated menu from SIR with all of these scents on it that you could hire, even at two o'clock in the morning. So I'd be sitting there at two o'clock in the, you know, 19 years old. I'm sitting there, I go, hmm, I'll try a Yamaha CS80 like Stevie Wonder plays, you know. And 4.30 in the morning, roadies would show up, you know, the flight case and they, you know, I, I was like a, a kid in a candy store. It was just fantastic. And they said, you know, we we're thinking something atmospheric for the intro. And um, I actually, you know, like I mentioned, Brian Eno, I was a big fan of ambient music in general, but I'd never attempted to use it, you know, in anything that I'd done before. And so I sort of, um, I only had a monophonic synth that night, like a, a, a mini Moog, Moog. Um, but I knew that there was this there was this technique that you can do where you sort of create like a, a mellotron. You know, like a mellotron is like has tapes for each note. You know, strawberry feels forever. Each flute note, you know, plays A, B, C, etc. And then you just hold when you hold down the notes, it plays them back. So I had this idea that you could do that with the faders on a mixing board. So I recorded a different note. Um, in the scale of E minor, you know, with with my with my Moog, and you know, played long sustained notes, and then I would sort of play these ambient sounds with my fingers, just pushing the faders up and down. And uh, that was how I made the intro. And so I, I put some of that in, and and then you know, I had the drums come in after that. And I, I had no idea what they would think of it, you know. And um, the band came in in the morning. I played it to them, stopped it. It's kind of a hush. And uh, the bass player said, "It's kind of like massage music, isn't it?" And I think he said something like, "Oh, I could, I could murder a massage right now. Can we get someone in?" But um, Matt Langer and uh, Mick Jones felt that this was this was worth pursuing and um so you know luckily for me it it stuck and it and you know i have to say it was a big milestone really in my career because it was all over the radio it's number one hit uh you know, massive radio play all over north america what did you think when you first heard that i think the short hairs on my short hairs stood up <laughs> Best way to put it. When it was at number two, were you guys aware of how long it was at that time? Or were you kind of looking at the charts every week or were you just kind of moving on to the other, the next thing? We kind of looked at it out of the corner of our eye. You know, we, we, we didn't want to, uh, uh, we didn't even want to discuss it for, for fear of jinxing it. <laughs> you know, uh, um, at some point we kind of, resigned ourselves to the fact that that we weren't going to make number one simply because we we had been in the top five for so many weeks that 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 at that point you don't move forward you move down you know maybe i'm wrong after uh, getting over the fact that that we were being kept out of number one by by a um by a, a, a cute little pop song, uh, uh, we 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 uh, we we just uh, took our number two with, with pride and went home. Well, you ran up against the biggest song of the '80s. Physical spent the most weeks at number one in the entire '80s. So, had waiting for a girl like you come out just a week later, or a week before, just one week, it would have been number one. <laughs> it just happened to fall right perfectly within that frame. This heart of mine has been hurt 
you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. Well, it, it, to have it a is, record like it is, that, number it two, right. if it went to number one, nobody would have remembered that it was at number two for 10 weeks, you know? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and then I suppose I want to know what love is wouldn't have been such a big deal either, would it? I want to know what love is. So I got to ask you about when you were recording the vocal in The Mystery Woman. Tell us that story. I had been singing the song uh, and, and, and singing some roughs in the studio for the for the earlier days as, as, as the guys worked on, uh, uh some of the instrumentals, you know, and, and I had a, a pretty good grasp on, on, on the song and, 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 um, uh, what, what I wanted to do, to do with it. But after, after singing it for a while, you, you, you definitely kind of lose the spontaneous emotional edge to it and and um so i was ex certainly excited to, to 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 go out and sing the final vocals a and i went out there and tested the mic and 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 um they were ready to roll tape and and it was almost like a like a like a perfect cue for a video or something as soon as soon as the 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 Thomas Dolby swirls with the with the synthesizer. And just as the beat to the song came in, I saw the studio door open. And this very attractive young young woman uh, in in a in a winter coat and and almost like a a russian kossoff hat you know uh, uh came walking down the steps and and took her coat and her hat off and sat in in you know uh, in this in the recording studios in front of the board there's always a sofa so people could could sit and listen while while there was the recording going on and and she came right in and took her coat and her hat off and sat down not not smiling not, not expressionless but 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 you know she she was listening intently, but she wasn't there to to uh, blow kisses at me or anything. You know she 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 was just listening, and she listened intently. And and I, I did a couple takes, and and they were both good takes. And and I, I think at the end of the last take, I, I really hit that high note at the end, right on. You know. And. Um, you know, I, I of course had to wait until the the the, the bottom of the bottom of the song tailed off, and then then we were done. And as soon as we were done, I I took the headphones off and ran for the door, and and she was gone. And I ran out the door and looked around to see if I could see her walking down the hallway, and there was no one there. Now I know I wasn't imagining things. I'm sure she was there. I'm sure she didn't. She didn't uh, sprinkle some magic powder and disappear. It, it's just one of those things that that happens, you know. Not often, but it does happen. And, and I wasn't going to run run around the studio or run out uh, on Eighth Avenue and start start looking for her or anything. So so uh, I kind I kind of just let let the let let that magical feeling flutter for a little while and then and then walked away from it. For a girl like you. But uh, Mutt and Mick certainly saw it. Uh, I saw it. It it, it, uh, it it made me emote just a little bit more when I was singing. For you. And uh, they they did not see her. Which I, I'm I'm not sure how they couldn't have seen her, but it made me think afterwards that they may have, no, knowing Mick and much sense of humor, they may have hired somebody to come in and do exactly what she did, just to get my heart pumping a little faster, you know. Yeah. And, and, but but what I said, did you know who that was? They looked at each other and go, "What? Who was? You know." And and I thought to myself, "Oh yeah, right." You know. And and then they said, "What are you talking about?" And I explained to them, and they said, 
Didn't see any of that. <laughs> so, so for all these years, they, they never said, "Oh, yeah, that was us." You know, no, it, it, they, they left, they left it a mystery, and I kind of like it like that. I know uh, Mick and Mark were waiting for some ad libs, ad libs, and I had no idea what I was going to do. So, so uh, I just let off my my emotions to take 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 me away, and and uh, I just went for those notes, and they came they they came out uh, true and and and, uh, and and right on the spot. Also introduced to a new generation through Glee, and most recently Stranger mm-hmm. Things. I mean that my yeah. kids picked up a ride yeah, on it and wild. they love that T- yeah. tell me yeah what were your thoughts on that well i i actually loved the show and um you know i was again anytime people that i that i feel uh you know because i can give i can refuse permission if necessary but uh i've not really had to do that there's a few cranky you know uh things that people have um, asked permission for but uh, in that case you know my I liked it my kids liked it so I was I was you know I'm flattered to to um, provide it for them how do you feel about all these years later the legacy of it I think it's it's held up it it, it hasn't dimmed any uh, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's not. It's not. Obviously, it 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 it, it shines br- as bright as a number two song as any number one song would. No, for sure, for sure. You know, so so, so I I I couldn't be happier or or hold it in any more esteem than I do. Yeah, I agree. Make sure that you leave us a comment about Foreigner. Are they the biggest Hall of Fame snub going right now? Where do you think Lou Graham sits in the in, in the list of the greatest of all time, the greatest vocalist? What are your memories of this incredible song? I just, I've always loved it. I just I love the synthesizer. Let us know in the comments. If you like our content here, we do invite you to subscribe below. We would love to have you as part of our community. We talk about music all the time, the history, the songs, everything. Until next time, three chords. Have the truth, my friends.